Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. My name is AJ. I'm the campus pastor here at Renewal Church in the Highlands. It's a blessing to be with you this evening. Evening services are just special, are they not? Tonight we ponder anew what the Almighty can do because Christmas is waiting to be born. It's 6 BC. A census is being taken across the Roman world and censuses in those times, they occurred every five years. And unlike the modern censuses we have, every 10 years, you're going to get a form in the mail or a census worker might show up at your door. You went where you were told. You went to the place of your birth to be registered and to be counted. And so scripture joins us with the journey of Mary and the journey uh, of a teenager who is very pregnant at this time and her husband, Joseph, as they journey to Bethlehem to be counted amongst the descendants of King David. Now, as they head toward Bethlehem and as they arrive, we find that things are teeming with people. The ancient Jews were known for their hospitality. It was a faith imperative to show hospitality to strangers whom they took into their home willingly. And at that time, they also had many roadside inns, inns like this one, uh, inns that had a wide open middle courtyard for the beasts of burden to be stored. And they were aligned or lined up uh, uh, with adjoining alcoves that the weary traveler could use for free and find rest. But on this particular evening, even those places were teeming with people. And so when it came time for Mary's firstborn to come into this world, he comes into this world in a manger. He is wrapped in the same cloths, in the same manner, put in the same manger as the animals that are born out in the fields of Bethlehem who are destined to go to Jerusalem as temporal sacrifices to die for the sins of the people. Jesus enters in in this way. And at the same time, in a field nearby, a detachment of angels also shows up. They show up to some random shepherds, if we could have the text on screen, and they say, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, great joy is the filling of the heart and the total fulfillment of it. It overflows, and it's for all the people, not just the boy's parents, not just for the shepherds who heard the message, uh, not only for Bethlehem or for their whole country, but for all the people. Guys, I'm the oldest of 16 kids. You better believe we're used to getting group gifts on Christmas. Anybody else out there, right? We don't always love to share, do we? But this is a group gift that we all receive, which doesn't diminish with sharing, which is for people all over the world. Go to Bethlehem and see. The angels point the way and the shepherds go, and when they arrive, they are in wonder and in awe of what they see. And everyone who hears the experience with the angels ponders it, because it's, it's amazing. Go to Bethlehem and see. Now, at this time, there are no magi that are in the picture. The magi don't come uh, for about another year. And so a year later, the magi come. Uh, they're bearing gifts. And they want Jesus to know this is for both your birthday and Christmas. All right? So it's double counting. Uh, but the gifts they bring are the sort that, while the parents may have been excited, who doesn't live a little, little gold at Christmas, am I right? What kid is going to love those gifts? 
I mean, they're kind of inappropriate for kids. It's like the equivalent of getting socks or a face mask for Christmas. Uh, so sorry, sorry, little Jesus, right? Um, but at this time, after eight days, he is brought to the temple to be circumcised and to be named. And when it comes time for him to be named, he is given the name that was given to his mother by the angel months before he was born. Given the name that is a Greek variant of Joshua, Jesus, which means he saves because he will save his people from their sins. Now, God sort of provided a lot here in providing the name and the gender ahead of time. He spared them from a lot of stress, right? They were one of the first families to know the gender of their child before it was born, which is fun, but also kind of tanks the gender reveal. Am I right? I mean, no blue baseballs, no dancing babies, no pink explosions that start forest fires. <laughs> Whoa. And think about all of the, the name-choosing stuff that they avoided, right? No sitting down and going through the, the baby name books going, what about Josiah? What about Hezekiah, you know? And Mary's like, oh, I had a boyfriend named Hezekiah once. Like, we can't do that, right? None of that, none of the, what about this unique spelling or that spelling? God sort of sets it up all in advance. Now, when it came time for my and Megan's firstborn to enter into the world, we had trouble with the name. We had a boy's name right away. Uh, only, I didn't realize it then, but I, was, I wasn't going to need that name for like eight years. I <laughs> uh, wondered if I would ever need it. Um, but at the time, it was the girl's name that really tripped us up. And we were not really kind of figuring out something that we loved. And uh, by the time it was time for her to go to the hospital, we still hadn't picked a name. And then by the time she was born, she still didn't have a name. And, and then at one point, Megan just kind of says, what about Sarah? And it felt right in the moment we just kind of knew that was the name and, and we went with it. It was only later that I was kind of like, man, I probably shouldn't have let her choose when she was all drugged up like that. <laughs> I mean, like that could have been really bad, but I guess it worked out. You know, Megan is on her game even with uh, the, the drugs and whatever, right, uh, that come with childbirth. Um, but of, of all the years, you know, three kids later, I've heard many times, because uh, it was always a surprise for us, we thought it was kind of fun, I've heard many times, you've got a girl, it's a girl, it's a boy. But the birth announcement that the angels give to Jesus is nothing short of unique. For unto you, excuse me, they give to the shepherds, right? Unto you is born this day a Savior. Now that one is different. And this for unto you language, it's an interesting phrase. It's hard to put our finger on what makes this exactly different from just saying, you know, to you is given. Uh, for unto you, it, it seems different in some way. It, it, it's a phrase that, first of all, transcends time, right? This for unto you given to the shepherds. In that moment, it was given to them but from the pages of Scripture, it leaps out to us as well. It invites us into the story and the narrative. It's just as fresh for us and upon our ears as it was to their ears. It invites us to receive Jesus as our own. It also has the connotation of a gift, something done for you that you cannot do for yourself. I remember early on in the pandemic, many of us are, are stuck at home under the quarantine and that sort of deal. Uh, the doorbell rings and I'm kind of scratching my head. I think it's like, a, uh, you know, just someone selling something. I'm like, they, they shouldn't be doing that anymore. We're all inside. And I eventually go to the door and I open the door and I look out and on the ground, there's a box. I'm like, interesting. I open up the box and then I was so excited. Inside, warm cinnamon rolls dropped off by one of our friends. I was like, Megan, quick, for unto us is given cinnamon rolls. Bring the plates. Like, this is a momentous occasion, right? I have a great love for food, as you can tell. All right. Um, but if we're to put our sticky finger on it, it's not just the idea of a gift given, but for unto us is also this idea that it carries gravitas, does it not? There's a significance uh, to what is being given. It makes me think of our, our current situation. We've seen pictures like this all over the world of people showing off their COVID-19 vaccines. 
It's a wonderful picture that is a sign of hope for the year to come, a gift for our culture, uh, which we are given. A miraculous thing, considering our, our current state of the world. For unto us is also a phrase that immediately connects the moment of Jesus' birth with the Old Testament. Because it's a paraphrase phrase of Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, and people, they would have been familiar with Scripture, they would have started making this connection immediately, right? And so when the angel says it, they immediately go here in their minds. And I'd like us to read this together, even if you're at home, on the stream, you're by yourself, let's read this together as a community. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies. But I'd like to come back to that verse 6 for just a minute here. Uh, Forward 1, verse 6, please. Verse, uh, forward 2 now. We're getting on the same page here. Verse 6 is a wonderful passage with a bunch of really cool titles of what this Savior, this anointed one, was going to be called. And so if we can go forward one here, we're almost there. He will be called Wonderful Counselor to grant us the wisdom of God. He will be called Mighty God to vanquish the enemies of humanity. Sin, death, and the devil. Keep going forward here, please. Everlasting Father, for he will adopt us as his children that we might be called sons and daughters of God. Uh, Keep going forward here. Two more. Uh, And Prince of Peace, he will be called, to give us the heart of God that we may share it with the world, that the gift given to us in the manger to share can go forward to the corners of the earth. Sorry, back one now. (laughs) We're We're just playing tag with one another here. The peace that's given by this Prince of Peace is the peace that can only come from God. That's that's the peace that we need. We can't get it anywhere else. Our world has been groaning under the weight of sin. As much as we'd like to put it out of our hearts and out of our minds, the most terrible things that we know of, we'd like to not invite those into our headspace because of what they do to us, right? But the world has been crushed under their weight. And not only the world, but humanity. That all of us, at our core, we recognize we see people doing things to one another that aren't in line with the way God created this world. He created it beautiful, and yet we see inequality. We've seen that this year. We've seen violence. We've seen illness. We've seen lack of fulfillment, which leads to depression, which leads to anxiety. And we know that in our own hearts, what we've seen isn't always pretty either. We know that in our own hearts, we're predisposed to selfishness, to arrogance, to harmful behavior, to addiction, to all of these things which are not in accordance with what God has given us. In our lives, we have filled the manger in our hearts with all manner of insufficient things for the task. That is precisely why God comes into this manger, why he becomes human, because that which Jesus has not assumed has not been healed. Great quote. That which Jesus has not assumed has not been healed. And thanks be to God, he assumes it all, even our humanity. How can the God of the universe who created all things enter into it and become human? How can he assume the sins of the world and of all of us, taking them to the cross so that he might be punished as a sinner in our place and go free? I mean, how can this be? How can the divine also be made man that we might be forgiven, and that through faith in Jesus, all people have the promise of eternal life with their everlasting Father. It's a wonderful, wonderful mystery. It's the mystery of the manger. 
Magician Harris III says that we came into this world with wonder switched on. Kids tend to still have it. And the manger invites us to reactivate it and to receive wonder this evening once again. Scripture says that in the fullness of time, when just the right time had come, God sent forth his Son. Scripture tells us that through God's word, right, that he made this world beautiful. It was badly damaged by sin, but throughout Scripture, uh, it's this one amazing, unique story of God on a rescue mission to redeem this world, to make it good again, just as it was in the beginning, to restore us through the cross. When Scripture speaks, speaks excuse me, of the fullness of time, the word here in Greek is chronos, linear time. It's distinct from another Greek word, kairos, which is sort of the appointed time or the time in the moment. And that certainly would be a word that would be appropriate here, but chronos is used. It's a real day on a real calendar. It's not a myth. It actually happened. It's a dot on the line of human history. It separates all that happened before from all that has happened since. And we now count time from this very moment, from the manger. We now measure our time, our days, our breaths, and our steps. For unto us is born this day, not just any day, but this day, a special day, a day that the Savior was given to us. Now at Christmas time, we're all sort of counting the days uh, down to Christmas. We love to, uh, and we long for the tradition, right, of gathering friends and family on this day uh, to live in the warm and fuzzy do we not, to take some time off, to relax, to celebrate and enjoy the moment. But as much as we like to keep Christmas Eve, Christmas Day free from the troubles that normally are in our lives and in our world, they sort of intrude this year, do they not? It's hard to not see how the pandemic has affected our celebrations. In many ways, it reminds us that Christmas is still waiting to be born. Howard Thurman is a civil rights leader, a mentor to some of the greats, including Dr. King, and a theologian. And he wrote a book called The Mood of Christmas. It's a book of poetry. I'd like to read from some of that poetry this evening. It's really powerful. He writes these words. He says, Where refugees seek deliverance that never comes, and the heart consumes itself as if it would live, where children age before their time and life wears down the edges of the mind, where the old man sits with mind grown cold, while bones and sinew, blood and cell, go slowly down to death, where fear companions each day's life and perfect love seems long delayed, Christmas is waiting to be born in you and in me and in all mankind. Christmas is not intended to be only a one-day thing or the start of just a 12-day affair. A perfect, perfect Christmas is not one devoid of struggle, hardship, and needy people because for into those things, God willed that his son, Jesus, would be born. God does want us to celebrate and be glad and to have joy and full hearts because we'll need the joy to push into the future to push past just the moment because when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. Mary pondered and wondered and treasured at all of these things in her own heart. In our hearts, may this day be a day that becomes incarnate. May it be a day that becomes incarnate in our hands, in what we do, incarnate through our speech, in what we say, and born into our neighborhoods, our homes, and our cities, 
And may we respond as Mary responds. In the moment that the angel tells her what is to happen, she says, may it be to me as you have said through me as you have said. And so today, for unto us a child is born. And this evening, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to whom his favor rests. Amen. We pray.